Prior to the 1940s, humanity's biggest killer were infections caused by tiny bacteria. Tuberculosis alone accounted for a quarter of all deaths in the early 19th century in Western Europe, with millions more succumbing to pneumonia, cholera, syphilis, and many others each year. All of this changed through a purely accidental discovery by the Scottish physician and microbiologist Alexander Fleming, which not only revolutionized modern medicine and ushered in its golden era, but changed the course of history itself. Alexander Fleming was born in Scotland in 1881 and was trained as a physician at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London. After completion of his training, the captain of the hospital's rifle club, in which Fleming was active and who really didn't want to lose Fleming from the team, convinced him to join the hospital's research department as a bacteriologist. Fleming would stay at St. Mary's Hospital for the entirety of his career, focusing on the study of bacterial cultures antibacterial substances. In September 1928, Fleming, who had the reputation of being a bit of a careless lab technician, returned from a family vacation to find that he had forgotten to put a lid on one of his bacterial culture plates, and that it had consequently been exposed to the air which, among other things, carried fungi spores from the laboratories below. As a result, a blue-green mold was now growing inside the culture plate. Curiously enough though, Fleming noticed that the bacteria was growing everywhere inside the plate, except directly around the mold. From this accidental observation he concluded that the mold must secrete a substance that killed the bacteria. He was able to identify the mold to come from the penicillium family, and he consequently named the bacteria killing mold juice penicillin. The discovery of this the first antibiotic was a remarkable coincidence. It was later realized that less than one in a thousand penicillium strains were able to actually produce penicillin. But how does it work? Bacteria cells are surrounded by a protective cell wall that requires molecules called peptidoglycans to link together. The penicillin now comes in and prevents the linking of these molecules thus causing the bacteria cell to break down and die. Since human cells do not require this molecule, only the bacteria is affected. Fleming published his findings in 1929 without attracting much attention in the field. Even Fleming himself was unsure about the importance of his discovery and saw potential use for penicillin more as a lab tool for bacteriologists rather than for medical purposes. When asked, would there will ever be a practical clinical application for penicillin, Fleming responded by saying, I don't know. It's too unstable, it will have to be purified, and I can't do that by myself. In the following years, Fleming sent his mold cultures to anyone who requested them, in the hope that they would be able to isolate the active compound for therapeutic use. But it took a whole decade before a team around Howard Florey and Ernst Chain at Oxford University succeeded. In May 1939, they had purified enough penicillin into a soluble powder to start trials. They took eight mice that had been infected with an especially virulent strain of Streptococcus and injected four of them with penicillin. The next morning, only the treated mice were still alive a result which Chain described as a miracle. A year later, the team was ready to experiment on humans. Police constable Albert Alexander, who had developed a severe infection on the face, became the first human to receive injections of penicillin. Within 24 hours, his condition improved. But before a full cure could be achieved, the meager supplies of penicillin ran out and Alexander unfortunately died a few weeks later. Another half a year later, 
Fleming himself used a purified penicillin of the Oxford team to attempt treatment of a work colleague of his brother's from a fatal infection of the nervous system. Within one week, he had completely recovered. It was this stunning success that showed the true potential of penicillin. By that time, Britain had been fighting in World War II for almost three years, and the British war machinery recognized penicillin as a potentially crucial tool for the recovery of military personnel to aid the fighting and win the war. Penicillin had become an instrument of war. Special efforts were taken to prevent the penicillin-producing mold strains to fall into enemy hands. Agents tried to track down every single one of the mold strain samples that Fleming had sent out over the past decade, and the War Cabinet set up a dedicated penicillin committee, which included both Fleming and Flory, to push for mass production. Since the situation in war-torn Britain wasn't ideal for this, Flory and his collaborator Norman Heatley traveled to the still-neutral US for help. Carrying the extremely valuable mold strains in a vial was considered too dangerous, as they could easily get lost or stolen by the enemy. Instead, they smeared the pockets of their coats with the mold. Meanwhile, German researchers still tried to get their hands on a penicillin-producing strain. Information leaked that one of Fleming's mold cultures was located in occupied France, and they demanded it to be handed over. However, the French gave them a similar, yet false strain that did not produce penicillin. Another sample was located in the Netherlands. Again, the Germans received a false strain without the ability to produce penicillin. It wasn't before October 1944 that German researchers finally managed to produce penicillin themselves. By then, it was too late to have a significant impact on the war. Before then, the only supply on the German side was captured from the Allies. Most likely it was with such captured penicillin that Hitler himself was treated after the assassination attempt in July 1944. While another victim of the attack, who did not receive penicillin, died of an infection, Hitler survived. One of the biggest obstacles for mass production was the tiny quantity of penicillin that Fleming's strain produced. The Allies therefore began a global search for viable alternatives, with promising candidates being found in China, India and South Africa. The most promising strain, however, was found in a moldy sweet melon that was sold on a fruit market in Illinois in 1943. It produced about six times as much penicillin as Fleming's original strain did. They furthermore subjected the mold to intense x-rays in the hope of causing a chance mutation in the genome that would increase the yield even further. Once the US entered the war, the US government took control over all penicillin production. What followed in the next couple of years was a remarkable collaborative effort between academia, industry and government to provide the military with a sufficient supply of penicillin. While in 1941 the US didn't have enough penicillin to treat even a single patient, by the end of 1942 they had enough for about a hundred. And by September 1943, enough penicillin was in stock to satisfy the needs of the entire Allied Armed Forces. In only a few short years after its first successful purification, its production had been transformed from a labor-intensive laboratory method that yielded tiny amounts of penicillin grown in bedpans or milk bottles, into a highly industrialized process that used 10,000 gallon deep fermentation tanks to produce highly refined penicillin in substantial quantities. While in 1939 penicillin had only been a laboratory curiosity, by 1945 it had transformed into a mass-produced real-world miracle that all but defeated the lethal threat of bacteria that we were exposed to for all our evolution, and nothing less than vanquished humanity's biggest killer. There are no precise numbers, but it is estimated that penicillin saved more than 100,000 lives on the Allied side just between D-Day and the final German surrender less than a year later. Since then, penicillin went on to save more than 200 million lives. In no small part, thanks to the introduction of penicillin and other antibiotics, human life expectancy jumped up by eight years between 1944 and 1972. 
For his discovery and subsequent work, Fleming received a knighthood and together with Florian Chain, shared the 1945 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. Believing that penicillin should be for the benefit of all humankind, they never filed a patent. The following decades were the golden age of antibiotics, which saw the development of new classes of antibiotics every few years. However, since the end of the 1960s, development has stalled. In fact, no new class of antibiotics has been discovered since 1987, and bacteria have fought back. Through overprescription, unnecessary and incorrect usage, many bacteria have evolved resistance to several or even all antibiotics. As a result, deaths due to multi-resistant bacteria are on the rise. It is estimated that by 2050 the number could reach 10 million deaths per year due to antibiotic resistance, more than are dying of cancer today. Without effective antibiotics, organ transplants, chemotherapy or even common surgeries would carry a considerably larger risk. We might be on the verge of a post-antibiotic era that plunges medicine back by several decades into a time before the discovery of penicillin. We might be about to lose one of our most effective weapons for our survival. Without a doubt, there is no drug that has shaped our modern world more than penicillin has. Alexander Fleming himself reflected on his discovery like this. One sometimes finds what one is not looking for. When I woke up just after dawn on September 28, 1928, I certainly didn't plan to revolutionize all medicine by discovering the world's first antibiotic. But I guess that was exactly what I did.